So when Weka has finished doing a classification, it has this report in the classifier output window. And at the end, under summary, it gives us a whole bunch of details about how well it performed. And so in this video, we're just going to talk about how to interpret the summary and results that are here, including which ones you would normally report. To make it a little more legible, we're going to flip over because I've made it a little bit bigger here. So we're going to look at three different sections, the summary, the accuracy by class, and the confusion matrix. Under the summary, the first two are really straightforward, the correctly classified instances and incorrectly classified instances. So this is just what percentage of instances did we put in the right class and what percent did we put in the wrong class. Uh, these numbers are going to add up to 100%. So uh, there's nothing complex going on here. So this is a you know, generally interesting thing to know, but you can end up having a high percentage of correctly classified instances and a really bad model because if you have, say, 90% of your instances all in one class, you could just say everything belongs to that class. You're going to be right 90% of the time, but the model's really stupid. Uh, we talk about how to deal with that in a video on class balancing that's also on my channel that you can click and see a link to. Um, but what it means is we can't just rely on correctly classified instances as the only thing we look at. That said, it's still interesting to have. So there's a few other statistics in here. Um, these are generally not something that you would report if you were, say, writing a paper on the performance of a classifier. You would pr certainly report the percentage of correctly classified instances along with some things from further down here. But just to talk about a couple of these and what they mean, the kappa statistic here, um, this is the Cohen's kappa. Uh, you, if you've done inner rater reliability, say in a qualitative experiment, this is what you get. And essentially, this is a value that takes into account the fact that you could just randomly guess and be right about what class something went into. So if you have perfectly balanced data, 50% in one class, 50% in the other class, then the likelihood that you're going to randomly guess without any knowledge is 50%. You could just pick an arbitrary class for an item, and you'd be right half the time. The Kappa statistic takes that into account. Wikipedia has actually a really nice uh, description of how this is computed and how it works. So essentially what you're getting here is an estimate of how well you would perform that takes into account the chance that you would randomly guess correctly. You want this value to be over zero. Zero means that you're basically doing as good as random guessing, and so the further it is above zero, the better it performs. Um, these measures, mean absolute error, root mean squared error, and relative error, uh, these are normally things that you would report with regression. You can do it with uh, classification, but it's a, it means something a little more complicated than what we know with regression. Um, and generally, you don't see these reported in a lot of scientific papers um, that are using a machine learning model. And so we're going to skip over those, uh, but you can find plenty of detail in any machine learning textbook that explains uh, essentially what they mean when you're doing classification. The thing that you are going to use a lot is this detailed accuracy by class. And so we have our three classes here for this data. We have accuracy for all three. And then our bottom line here is the weighted average. So it kind of gives you an overall picture of how well we're doing. At the top of each column, we have a label for what this is. Um, and let's just start with these first five. So we have the true positive rate, the false positive rate, precision, recall, and an F measure. Uh, these are super standard things that you would report, I think, for pretty much any classification. And uh, it's helpful to have a little chart to think about how we're looking at this. OK, so this graphic is taken from uh, Wiki Commons. And it's a great description that's going to help us find all these things. So the false positive rate is going to look at what percentage of our data was classified into this section. So what we're looking at here in the circle, these are things that were classified into a certain class. And then outside the circle are things that were classified as not part of that class. Uh, the green ones actually belong in the class. And the red ones, this whole half, including the outside, are the ones that are outside the class. So false positives are the percentage of items that fall in this pink half of the circle 
divided by all of the items that we have and the total number of instances that we have. The true positive rate is done the same way. Uh, the percentage of items that are correctly classified into this green half of the circle divided by the total of number of items that we have. So essentially, what percentage of all our data falls into this pink square is our, pulse, is our false positive rate. What percentage falls into the green section is our true positive rate. Now, precision and recall are really important factors and I find them very hard to remember which one's which uh, because the names feel a little bit arbitrary to me. Um, but the concepts themselves are pretty straightforward. So precision tells us out of everything that we classified as part of the class, what percentage of them actually belong there. So it's our true positives, the ones that were correctly put in the class, divided by how many total we put in the class. Essentially, if we put something in class A, what percentage of them are actually correctly in class A? Recall gets us how much of the stuff that belongs in class A did we actually capture. So we have our true positives divided by everything that actually belongs in class A. So essentially what this is telling us is, out of everything in class A, what percentage of them are we able to find? Precision and recall are really important statistics that independently tell you different things about how well you're performing. And if we flip back over to look at uh, what we have here, our F measure actually combines precision and recall. So it's the harmonic mean of precision and recall put together. And uh, these three things, precision, recall, and F measures, are very standard things to report uh, when you're doing machine learning. We also have a few other statistics here that give us kind of weighted ways of understanding performance. The one that you're most often going to use is the rock area. This is the receiver operator characteristic area under the curve, uh, which sounds again very complicated. But basically what it is telling us is if you had one item from each class, so say you just have two classes, you have an item from class A and an item from class B and I show them to you, what percentage of the time are you going to correctly put them in their classes? So you know there's one of each, so you either say the one on the right belongs in A, the other one belongs in B, or vice versa. That accounts for the fact that you may have really unbalanced data. So maybe 90% of your items belong in class A, 10 of them belong in class B, uh, but the area under the curve just says, if I gave you one of each, what percentage of the time would you get it right? So it is a measure of accuracy, but it does it in a weighted sort of way. We want this to be as high as possible. Uh, if you have a score around 0.5, that means you're essentially randomly guessing. Uh, anything above 0.5 means you're doing better than random guessing. Anything below means you're not. Uh, remember that this is an area under a curve. And so if we just were to draw a straight linear diagonal, that represents random guessing the area under that would be half of the available space. So we want this number to be over 0.5. A good rule of thumb is that if you get to kind of 0.8, that's considered a pretty strong result. The PRC area under the curve, this deals with precision and recall. That's what PR is. Um, and uh, so the receiver operator characteristic uses the true positive and false positive rate as the axes that you're looking at to draw a curve. The PRC uh, uses precision and recall instead. The rock area, curve, area under the curve tends to be a better choice because uh, precision and recall don't really account for true positives in any of the statistics. That said, if you have really unbalanced classes, PRC area under the curve can be better. But generally, and in all the research that I've done and seen, uh, the receiver operator characteristic area under the curve. The rock AUC is what's reported pretty much all the time. I don't think I've seen any of these other statistics reported. And so um, precision, recall, F measure, and rock area, those give you a really good picture of how well things are performing. We tend to give the weighted average for that, the, uh, you know, how well it does for the whole data set, um, though I'll often replicate this exact table in, uh, in the results that I present in my work. And then finally, we have the confusion matrix down at the bottom. This is really useful uh, both for Weka uh, 
this matrix is, appears in other places, which we'll talk about in just a second, and in general to show how well your classifier is doing. So on the y-axis here on the right, we have the actual class that data belongs in. So here we have three classes. This whole first row is class A, the second row is class B, and the third row is class C. Uh, if they have labels, as they do in our data, those labels will appear here as well. And so if we add up all the elements in, say, the third line here, that tells us how many elements actually belong in class C. The top row here, the x-axis, is nicely labeled classified as, so it tells you what items were classified as class A, class B, and class C. So for example, this 230 here, that's how many elements of class A were classified as class A. If we go down to the bottom, this is how many elements of class C were incorrectly classified as class A. Class B, which is our small class here, you can see there's a lot fewer items. Um, that's always a tricky, tricky one when you have one class that's much smaller than the other. And so here we can see 16 of class B items were classified as A, 23 were classified as B, and 10 were classified as C. These are raw numbers of instances that we are looking at. And so this gives a really good picture of how well a model is doing. You can see if there's one class that it's performing well on or poorly on, and it gives insight beyond what the statistics have. So if we were to flip back over to Weka here, these are the results that we're looking at. They're just a little bit smaller. Um, as I mentioned, our class B is a lot smaller than the others. This is from an example, which you will see in another video on class balancing, where we learn how to deal with that. But before I tried to attend to that fact, if we just were to run a naive Bayes classifier on this, our correctly classified instances were really high, 91.5%. Our rock area under the curve was really good at 0.963. Those statistics all look good. These question marks are a little bit troubling, but if you come down and look at the confusion matrix, you immediately see what's going on, which is nothing ever gets classified as B, including elements of B. No element of class B was correctly classified. 30 of them went to class A, 19 of them went to class B. And so if someone asks, is this a good model? You kind of have to say no, right? It can differentiate classes A and C pretty well, but it doesn't know anything about class B. It just ignores all of those. And so even though our numbers look pretty good here overall, the confusion matrix shows us that the model is performing really poorly on class B, which suggests we need to do something about it. And as I mentioned, uh, in another video, you can see how we handle that and get slightly better results. So there you go. That's a general overview of how you're going to interpret the results and accuracy for classification in Weka.